is institutions shape how our world works. Not individuals acting individually, but individuals acting as mediated through the world of institutions. I think there's a, a deep issue that will be made more and more evident as we go on. Alain already touched on it, which is there is a tendency today to see the larger, let's just call it the world of networks, since that's probably the most common jargon term, uh, connections of people as mediated by technology especially, as somehow displacing the world of institutions. That's probably naive. There's certainly a new level of human interconnectivity and human agency via these networks, but they don't simply push aside the world of institutions. Businesses are still a center of power, arguably the center of power. Certainly the financial institutions writ large, the financial institutions that call institutional reality, is one of the biggest sources for all of us of concern in the world. So it's kind of silly to think that they're no longer a player. So these three levels, though, are really all need to be embraced. And I'm going to summarize this with a, a very simple uh, kind of metaphorical, but I think it's actually a, a structural way of seeing today's situation that Otto Scharmer has been using for the last couple of years. And I think it's been very helpful. He, he says, we want to understand the plight of the world. We have to embrace three numbers. 1.5 is the first. And Otto uses that to point us to what we all know, which is the, the ecological divide. The separation of human and nature. 1.5 is a, more or less the conventional estimate. I think most ecologists think probably sometime 20 years or so ago, the totality of human activity on the planet more or less started to pass the carrying capacity of the planet, probably 20 years ago. And of course, it's accelerating. So to go from one to 1.5 in a mere quarter century is quite phenomenal. If China and India were to reach the level of material affluence and waste of the West, we would need three planets. That's not going to happen. So this accelerating ecological divide is, in some sense, one fundamental reality that establishes the context for everything we think about the future. But then, of course, there's the social divide. And here, in this context, I would say that this second kind of dimension of our reflections is really about what does it actually mean to be an integrated, I use that word in quotes because it can mean so many different things. Let's just say a coordinated global society. The multiculturalism of this meeting is without doubt one of the most important aspects of the meeting. 35 countries coming together. And while we're not exactly proportionately representative, as if we were, there'd be a very large number of Chinese and Indians and a relatively small number of us Eurocentric cultures. Nonetheless, it's something that for all of us would be very meaningful about these three days, to be together with colleagues from around the world. Anand reminds us, although I think we could still reflect a little deeper, of the Western centrism of our thinking. Rational or irrational? It's a very Western concept. What's irrational? Oh, well, it's not rational. The oldest Chinese symbol for mind is, of course, Chinese is a wonderful language because it's iconic. It's pictures. It's stick figure drawings. So in a way, you can kind of look back through history and get a very deep window onto the consciousness of earlier ages. The oldest Chinese symbol for mind is actually a drawing of the heart. 
It is the Western culture that said mind lives here in the brain. And that rationality defines a mental functioning. And that irrationality is somehow not mental functioning. So I leave it to you as a question. How do we reconcile rationality versus irrationality? A very classic Western dualism with the notion that mind is centered here. It's not the same as emotion, by the way. Rationality versus emotion, also a very Western idea. The versus part is really the heart of the Western. As Westerners, we're deeply conditioned to think in dichotomies and dualities. Deeply conditioned. So much so that it's very hard for us to see. But a classic response of a traditional culture or an Eastern culture is it A or B? Maybe. We see that as sloppy thinking. Is it has to be A or B? No. Life is much more complex than our rational lens. I just use that to illustrate this global divide at one level is a social divide. We all might espouse, we might espouse a harmonious global society. Probably every one of us in this room would like to think of ourselves as relatively open-minded. That would be a term we would use, which basically means our rationality is somehow open. But it's a long journey. And it's a journey none of us have ever been on. It's a new journey. And it's going to require profound openness. Seeing the deepest habits of our intellect, which are cultural, not biological. Profoundly cultural. And of course, as Westerners, since we've been the uh, dominant culture, it would be particularly difficult for us. Because that dominance is shifting very quickly. It's very complicated because, of course, the Eastern cultures have been so westernized. So in many ways, they're kind of like the first generation of women in management. They have to be more like men than men. Right? So as the Eastern cultures rise to some sense parity, they, they have had to become very western. But they're not. Uh, Otto often uses two Otto usually defines as the spiritual divide. And he uses a number three. So 1.5, 2, and 3. This is the summary of the way he's been presenting this for the last few years. And the spiritual divide is a very simple notion at one level, which is that despite all our material efforts in the West, we're actually not very happy. Hard for us to see this easier for young people to see it because they are more on the periphery. Easier for people from other cultures to see it because they are catapulted into this Western, materialistic, consumer-oriented society. But the number three roughly reflects the number of people in the world who either die or are in extreme state of dysfunction for psychological reasons. Roughly three times as many people in the world commit suicide as die from homicide or war. Take their own lives versus lose their lives at the hand of another. And we all, Anand said, if we thought of society as a living organism, Ari's book, which was so influential for so many of us, The Living Company, it's a simple idea. But the separation of human and nature has been unfolding for many thousands of years. It also largely characterizes the Eastern cultures as well as the Western cultures. It probably roughly can be associated with the agricultural revolution, not the industrial revolution. When all of a sudden we began to think that nature existed to serve us, nature became a thing in our Western languages and now, right? The forest was no longer a living system. It was timber resources. That's a shift that began to occur gradually 
thousands of years ago. The journey to profound reconnection with the living world is a spiritual journey, is a social journey. So as I say, in a way, it all comes full circle. So the third divide is a spiritual, social, profoundly ecological divide. We have little idea what it will mean to once again talk with the animals and to listen to what the trees are saying to us. It sounds fanciful to us. That's the point. It's been a very long journey of separation. That journey will take us generations. But it is important to understand the nature of the journey ahead. Great, thank you, Peter.